This is Jeff Standridge, and this is the Innovation Junkies Podcast. If you want to drastically improve your business, learn proven growth strategies, and generate sustained results for your organization, you've come to the right place. Over the next half hour, we're going to be sharing specific strategies, tactics, and tips that you can use to grow your business, no matter the size, no matter the industry, and no matter the geography. Weekly, we'll bring in a top mover and shaker, someone who's done something unbelievable with his or her business, and we'll dig deep. We'll uncover specific strategies, tactics, and tools that they've used to help you achieve your business goals. Welcome to the Innovation Junkies Podcast. Hey guys, if you're looking to put your business on the fast track to achieving sustained strategic growth, this episode is sponsored by the team at Innovation Junkie. To learn more about our Growth DX, go to innovationjunkie.com backslash growth DX. Now let's get on with the show. Hey guys, Jeff Standridge here. And this is Jeff Amrine here for another episode of the Innovation Junkies podcast. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. We've got an awesome guest today. Jeff, I'm very excited to, to, uh, to bring him on and, and visit with him a little bit. His name's Josh Linkner. Uh, a few highlights about Josh. He's a five-time tech entrepreneur. Uh, he's a hyper-growth CEO, a New York Times bestselling author, venture capitalist. Started his career as a professional jazz guitarist that I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. And he's the host of the Creative Troublemakers podcast. Uh, he is an expert on innovation, disruption, and hyper-growth leadership. Josh, great to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Fantastic. Well, Josh, we like to start our uh, our podcast episodes when we remember to do so, and we're going to remember today with just a random musing, right? Just something for us to talk a little bit about. Uh, the random musing today uh, is generally provided by Kevin and Reagan, who help us to produce the show. Uh, our random musing is, what's your favorite food that when you consume it, you tend to overindulge? Or in other words, it's bec- it becomes your guilty pleasure. This one is easy for me. I'm a, I'm a pizza junkie, man. It's like one of the four food groups for me. I have a slightly odd obsession, in fact, with pizza. And by the way, all types, thick, thin, medium, whatever, any topping, it's great for breakfast. To me, it's the ideal food. You can hold it in one hand. It's portable. You can put anything you want on it. It's like a, a, a creative canvas waiting for expression. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm for sure. But by the way, I will say that the, the best of all, I have to show a little love here for my hometown of Detroit is mm. Detroit style pizza, which is sort of like half the thickness of Chicago deep dish. Cheese goes all the way to the edge and the sauce goes on top of the cheese. A little ah. different, but really good. Have to try that. Have to try that. Jeff, what's yours? Well, I was, I was sitting here. I mean, I overindulge in all types of food, but I would say my favorite are giant chocolate chip cookies. Mm. Most people will just eat one. If there's a whole pan full, I'm going to eat at least 12 every time so i mean it's it is a uh it's like a foot race to type 2 diabetes with those giant chocolate chip cookies but i love them. chewy or chewy or crunchy <laughs> uh you know i like both but i, I like i like a little bit crunchy maybe on the outside and then kind of chewy in the center so i like mine it. just a little bit burned on the bottom side not burnt but just very very brown on the bottom side so very crunchy but a little bit brown but my favorite uh uh, or guilty pleasure food or favorite food my mother cooks lunch for the entire family every sunday just about every sunday pre-covid it was nine sundays out of ten post-covid it's maybe once or twice a month but uh you know it's uh south good old south arkansas uh food fried okra fried squash uh potatoes some kind of a meat, you know, uh, and, and two or three different uh, uh, desserts. So um, it doesn't matter what the, what the menu is, it's, it's a guilty pleasure, and I always eat too much. So. So, so here's a question, a follow-up question, Jeff. When you have chicken fried steak, is it white gravy or brown? It's white gravy. It's oh, white well gravy. done. Yeah. You passed. Yeah. You're, 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 you're legit. And and on and on biscuits in the morning, it's either white gravy, it's any kind of gravy, <laughs> white gravy, red eye gravy, or chocolate gravy. If you've never had that, so wow, Southern cuisine. That's right. Well, hey, let's cut to the chase. Josh, tell us a little bit about Josh Linkner and and uh, help us understand a little bit about who you are. Well, first of all, I really appreciate being with you, and I appreciate your focus on innovation. I have this core belief, and maybe, maybe you share this, but. That, that there are 7 billion people on this planet who in one degree or another have dormant creative capacity, me, me included, and I study human creativity. Uh, 
So I believe that the uh, things that we crave the most, whether it's progress in our business or better outcomes in, in healthcare or education or our environment, are the answers are inside of, of us. And if I can help people liberate their creative abilities, if I can help them build skills to be more innovative on a daily basis, I just think the world is a better place. So that's really my passion in life. Um, but as you point out, I, I started my career as a jazz guitarist, and I feel like I just play jazz every day. And first I did that playing you know, instruments, and I played all over the country, and I still perform today. But um, then I switched, and, and I was playing jazz with business, and then I was playing jazz and writing books. And, and so I still consider myself a jazz musician at, at, at the core, and I'm just using different instruments these days to, to try to create as big of an impact as I can. Very good. So uh, I actually went to college on a music scholarship until they realized that I was not innately talented. I just worked hard. And so uh, <laughs> that ended my career there, I guess. What was it? A particular instrument? It was or wind, you composite? wind instruments. It was low brass wind instruments. I was in a military band for a period of time and, and a college band and, and uh, thought I might want to do that, you know, in a, in a teaching capacity. But like I said, uh, they, they figured out that I just worked hard and, and the, the innate talent was on a relatively low scale. So, you know, it's well, I highly doubt that. But um, <laughs> the nice thing about creativity, you know, I've been studying creati human creativity, read every research paper you can imagine, et cetera. And the research is crystal clear that all of us have creative ability, mm -hmm. all of us. And, you know, you're, you're, I know you're being very modest about your, your talent, but, you know, talent in general is, is less important really than, than like you said, the, the hard work. And, and the same mm -hmm. is true with creativity of any kind. It doesn't have to be an instrument or painting on canvas. It could be creative in, in your business or in sales or in any aspect of our professional lives. The good news, I always like to say that creativity, it's more like your weight than your height. So for me, I'm a pretty short guy and, and, and try as I may, I won't grow a foot by next month. But my, 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 my weight, I can control based on my input mm. and diet and exercise, nutrition, et cetera. And that's exactly how people's creativity is. There, there's no such thing as an uncreative person. Like we're hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. And if people are open-minded and they're willing to put in a little bit of work, it's a, it's a skill that can be absolutely grown and expanded and put into use. Very good. Go ahead, you know, I had a kind of follow-up question there. I, I read a stat a few years back that something like, 40% of all the division one uh, marching band students, music students were, were also either science, technology, engineering, math, STEM majors, very high crossover between people that have musical talent and those people that tend to pursue things that are highly creative or maybe even highly uh, mathematical. Given the fact that both of you are really musicians, talk about that a little bit. I don't have a musical background, but I was a STEM major, but I thought that was really intriguing. How has the, the music informed your path towards being innovative and creative? Go ahead, Josh. Well, for me, it was my main teacher. I mean, I've taken business classes, but but really jazz was my my, my learning lab. And, and, you know, I think there's a lot of crossover. You're right. I mean, it takes, you know, sort of precision. When, when you're playing an instrument, there's both the, the technical aspects, being able to perform effectively, and then there's also the creative aspects. And the thing I love about jazz specifically is that it's sort of this dangerous art form where every day when you play the same song, it's always different. Just like our conversation is unscripted, we're, we're just kind of riffing off of one another. That's very much what jazz is, a live conversation with other musicians and, of course, the audience that you're in front of. And to me, it's cool because it's the only art form where you're composing and performing in real time. It's simultaneous, real-time innovation. And so I think there's a direct corollary. I've seen that many times. I've hired about 10,000 people over the years as I built tech companies. And, and very often, you're right, some of the best coders happen to be musicians because you know they recognize patterns, they're problem solvers, they know how to you know execute with precision. They also know how to you know where, where and if to bend the rules a little bit in order to, to drive their desired outcome. So I think it's actually a wonderful training ground um, for, for many pursuits in life. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think it is the perfect intersection, as you said, Josh, it's the perfect intersection between between the technical aspects of the 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 counting and the mathematics and the theory kind of elements behind music and the create the creative aspects. Right. So I was more of a methodical musician. Right. Uh, less on the creative side. And I think about, you know, my wife and I today, I, I consider myself to be fairly creative on putting a biz, business deal together, uh, uh, selling a solution to a client or what have you, put me in a blank room and I can't see anything visionary wise into the room. Now reverse that and put my wife into the room and she can decorate 
phenomenally, but don't ask her to put a business deal together, right? And and so it's interesting. We both have creativity, but it just stems from different bases, so to speak. You know, I'm so glad you said that because we tend to have a fairly narrow definition of what is creativity. We think it involves, you know, painting on a canvas or playing an instrument or whatever. But I like where you're going with that is because there's lots of flavors of creativity. And and those not only range in the types, like, for example, maybe you're better at one particular ch- challenge than, than your wife is, but also yeah. scale. You know, for some reason, we set, tend to say that innovation has a minimum threshold. Like if it's not a billion dollar idea, it doesn't count. But I'm really fascinated by micro innovations. I call them big little breakthroughs, mm. which are far less risky and far more accessible to us all. And so the point is that the creativity doesn't have to only look and act a certain way. It can be lots of different types of creativity and can be lots of different t- magnitudes as well. Very good. You know, um, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of innovation and hyper growth leadership. Jeff and I, uh, in our practice with Innovation uh, Junkie Consulting, we um, we focus on helping organizations develop sustained strategic growth, and and innovation is one of the tools that we help them uh, uh, leverage to get there. Uh, talk a little bit, if you will, about this relationship between innovation and leadership, particularly high growth leadership. Well, yeah. So first of all, I would argue, and just on the leadership front, that that you know, cultivating the creativity of your team members is sort of project number one. In other words, I, I can't think of anything more important. You know, it's a shame too, because we often hire these talented, amazing, smart, creative people, and then force them to just keep their head down and do what they're told, mm. as opposed to express themselves and, and be a contributor to the overall uh, masterpiece that that's that's being uh, built. And so I think that you know, leaders' job is to create a safe environment. Think about like a greenhouse for a second, where a greenhouse is the optimal conditions for plants to grow. I think leaders need to create a greenhouse for creativity, really. So creating a cultural cultural construct with the right rituals and rewards that support and enable the creative process as opposed to restricting it. And with respect to growth, I mean, I would say this, that many of the growth drivers of the past have become commoditized. You know, you, you can no longer control geography or price or information. And, and today we live in a world of dizzying speed and exponential complexity and ruthless competition. And especially coming out of COVID now, where, where many patterns of the past have been broken, I feel like the world is hit, world is hit a giant reset button. So the one thing that to me is crystal clear is that we can no longer simply rely on the models of the past and expect the same results. So growth doesn't come from compliance. Growth comes from originality and from pushing the creative boundaries. And in fact, many of the the, the, the things that we used to win on, the, the quote unquote hard skills, have become commoditized and outsourced and automated. So you say, well, what's left? I mean, how can you delight clients? How can you drive growth? How can you attract and retain the best and brightest people? To me, it all all roads lead back to human creativity and using innovation as a manageable resource to fuel growth. Hmm. Interesting. So w- w- what do you see when you talk about em- empowering, so to speak, people to be creative? How do you do that within the construct of a a framework or, or uh, uh, guidelines, so to speak, because creativity for the sake of creativity in the business sense doesn't produce the outcomes we want, but creativity within the confines of a standard or a set of boundaries or expectations. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, excellent question. I mean, when you when I play jazz, even though only 1% of the notes are on the written page, those markers are really important. You know, the chord structure, the tempo, you know, there, there are some, otherwise it's chaos. Mm-hmm. So I do think that some structure and technique is really important. But, but and, and the way that we do that as leaders though, is that I think job number one is creating a safe environment. It turns out the single biggest blocker of creative output is not natural talent, it's fear. And if you think about it, it's this insidious force that basically robs us of our best thinking. And you're exactly right, by the way, not, not creativity for the sake of it. I definitely don't want people running down the halls, drawing on the walls with purple crayons. Mm-hmm. It's using applied creativity, pl- creativity to solve problems and seize opportunity. And so anyway, it gets back to me to rituals. So, so rather than speaking in abstract, let me just give you an example. One of the people that I interviewed for my new book, which is called uh, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And actually spent over a thousand hours in research and interviews with CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, Grammy award-winning musicians, all kinds of cool people. Mm-hmm. But w- one guy that I interviewed, he has a pretty cool ritual. I was, I was asking him at his company, how do you keep your people leaning into change? How do you keep them taking responsible risks? And he says they do a ritual. Every Friday, they, they have F up Fridays. Hmm. They say the whole word. I'll, I'll just be polite here. But yeah. F up Fridays go like this. Full company, brown bag lunch. 
And one by one, each person has to stand up and share what did they F up that week and what did they learn from it? And then when someone inevitably didn't F something up, everyone's like, well, why not? What are you going to try next week? And just think about the message that that simple ritual drives into the DNA of this company, that innovation is part of the job, that we, we have your back in success as much, in, in failure as much as success, and that taking responsible risks, uh, that, that's required activity for you. Hmm. And so again, a simple ritual like that can make all the difference in the world in liberating the creative capacity of your team. Hey folks, we'll be right back with the episode. But first, we want to tell you about a limited opportunity to take advantage of our Growth DX. For a limited time, we're offering a free strategy call to see whether our unique diagnostic tool is right for you. Go to innovationjunkie.com backslash growth DX to learn more. Bringing it back to music, um, the, 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 the period before the classical period in music, before about 1700 or so, um, was fairly, fairly static. There, was, there were a few masterpieces but the creation of the chromatic scale that occurred in about 1700 or so led into the classical period of music, which was one of the most prolific periods of creativity and masterpiece generation. So the institution, to your point, of some basic guidelines and some basic frameworks, some markers, if you will, actually spurred innovation versus stifled it, or creativity and versus stifling it. Hundred percent, yeah. And when you study, as I have, you know, for twenty plus years, the that the, the rituals, mindsets, and tactics of the most innovative people, um, it's the right balance between some structure and some some room for for freedom. You don't want to stamp out cookie cutter ideas, but nor do you want to just have you know complete complete chaos. Uh, you know, one one example of a technique. So w- many of us, when we we try to generate ideas, we brainstorm. Mm-hmm. Brainstorming, though, is a terrible technique. It's it's way outdated. It was invented in nineteen fifty eight, and it just generally yields mediocre ideas. So there are better techniques that, that, that drive better results. One fun one I'll just share with you is called role storming, R-O-L-E. So role storming is brainstorming, but in character. In other words, you're pretending that you are somebody else. So Jeff, let's say, for example, instead of you being Jeff in the next brainstorm session, you're playing the role of Steve Jobs. Mm. Well, no one's going to laugh at Steve for coming up with a big idea. They might laugh at Steve for coming up with a small one. So because you know you bear no responsibility for that idea, you are totally liberated to say anything you want. Hmm. And it's the simplest technique. Everyone in the room chooses any character they want to be. You could be a supermodel, a villain, a, a sports figure, a literary ar- artist. You could be Picasso. You could be a four-year-old child or a, an alien from the future. But the idea is that you have to stay in character while you're taking on an actual real-world problem. And that simple twist to a, an idea jam session can yield disproportionate results. It's really very powerful. You, Jeff and I have talked before about Edward de Bono and his his six thinking hats uh, uh, approach. It kind of reminded me of that when you were talking about stepping into a role that's not necessarily your own. Very, very similar lateral thinking methodology where one person sticks to just the facts, one person, you know, devil's advocate, one person is blue sky and optimism. And, 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 and I mean, it seems like a very practical way to do it, to avoid groupthink where you have dominant players in the group, you have some people that are more introverted and quiet and don't, never say a word. That role playing, that's that's strong. That's really cool. It's funny, I did this with a group of executives one time at Sony Japan. I met this guy, he was like the stiffest human being I've ever met. Dark <laughs> suit, white shirt, the tie is strangling him. Anyway, we got him role storming as Yoda. And <laughs> I've never seen personal transformation like this. This this dude's jacket's off, his tie's undone. He's like leaping around the room and the whiteboards were filled with ideas. And critically, I didn't teach him to be creative. He had that inside him all along, as do all of us. But he was in a role that historically forbid it. We put him in a new role. And again, he was able to really release this incredible superpower that we all have and we all share. Very good. Um, let's talk about how we, how we um, drive innovation uh, on a work team, right? So uh, you've, you've got a work team, uh, they're facing a big problem. Do you do you have a specific process that you take them through to actually help them formulate the problem and, and work through to, a, to an ultimate in desired solution? Yeah, so I, my first book was called Discipline Dreaming and it's a five-step process. And in there I start with what's called a creativity brief. You're sort of really studying the problem at hand. You know, you kind of fall in love with the problem before you get onto a solution. One fun thing is to ask 20 questions about the problem. So before you, we're also solution based. It's it's easy to leap and like, oh, let's come up with an idea. Mm -hmm. And then you become 
sort of dogmatic on that idea and, and tunnel vision. Whereas it was better to actually study the problem and really frame the problem and understand the nuances and what are the blockers and what's been tried historically and, and sort of set the stage way, way before you really get into jamming mode. The other thing that's good is to, to sort of um, assemble ingredients. Like think about going to the farmer's market. You, you know, oh, this tomato looks nice. Oh, this cucumber. And you're not even sure what you're going to cook with it yet. And so the, this notion of hunter-gatherer type stuff, sort of gathering and bringing back ingredients that may or may not ultimately go into the creative dish that you're you're looking to whip up, that's also helpful in preparation before you get into some some techniques for 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 idea jamming, which is my preferable word to uh, to brainstorming. And so I think that a lot of things, that, that one of the blockers often that happens is that we're so quick to come up with an answer. We discover the quickest, easiest, fastest a- idea, historically based and and safe. And then we, 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 we are tunnel vision against it as opposed to kind of letting the creativity unfold. Because often it's not that first idea. It's the idea that leads to the idea that leads to the next idea that is the killer one that we're looking for. What do you see the role is the, of the customer or the key stakeholders uh, in in that creative process or that problem solving process? Crucial, and I, I know you follow De Bono's work and I'm sure IDO and others, but um, yeah, you know that that's the other problem. We often busy executives think they're their own customer, and they, how would I enjoy this product for a 13 year old girl? Well, I'm a 50 year old man. Like that's a stupid thing. So how do we how do we really connect? with empathy to those customers. And it's funny though, that we can turn that switch on pretty quickly. There's a study I wrote about in my in my new book, Big Little Breakthroughs, uh, conducted by uh, University of Chicago. And, and they, they brought a group of people together, similar backgrounds and such. And the assignment was to come up with new ideas for a new potato chip, potato chip flavors for pregnant women. Hmm. But they divided the group in half. One group was given instructions that said, use your logic and reasoning to come up with the most logical potato chip flavors. The next group was given empathetic instructions. They said, okay, before you start, close your eyes and spend one minute imagining what is it like to be a pregnant woman? What does it feel like? What is it, you know, what emotions might you be having? And then that was the only difference in the instructions. Then they had to generate ideas and the, the ideas were later judged by a panel of experts. And and the empathetic group blew away, like crushed the, the logical group just by spending one minute of, of kind of connecting empathetically to the customer. They came up with fun names like pickles and ice cream, potato chips, and there was margaritas for moms because, you know, obviously pregnant women can't drink. There was sushi and wasabi chips because, you know, pregnant women are supposed to abstain from raw fish. So anyway, the point is that even a little empathy can go an enormous way in driving better creative output. Empathy is a big part of design thinking and, and uh, you know, putting yourself in, in someone else's shoes, the ideal customer is part of that, but it's also important to not just talk to them, but also observe what, what's your, what's your take on the need to actually observe what people do? Because sometimes the feedback you get from a customer or stakeholder can be misleading. Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, if you can observe people sort of in their natural habitat far better, and sometimes what people might self report is different than what they actually do or want to do. And sometimes it's not that they're lying. They might not be able to articulate accurately. Um, what what's what's going on? So you're, no question about it. I mean, whether it's an internal customer or an external one, if you can if you can get them, you know, touching and feeling and having a tactile experience, you know, so much better, so much better. By the way, one of the things that I, I think we were talking about where where do people trip up sometimes? We often think that the process goes like this: idea generation. Okay, there's my idea. Now I'm just going to like roll it out globally. So you go instantly from like uh, initial idea to wide scale execution. Mm-hmm. That to me is problematic on a number of fronts. First of all, it's wildly risky. Uh, what if you're wrong? You know, you're betting the farm on it so that you're taking a, you know, too big of a risk, et cetera. So I'm much more of a fan of you know, ideation, narrow your list down perhaps to a, a few ideas, but then, it's, then rapid prototyping. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's all around experimentation. And you start with more ideas. So instead of coming up with one idea and betting your life on it, come up with like 30 ideas, narrow the field down to 10, and then test those 10. And you can test them. I recommend to start testing in the most low cost, fastest way possible. I think of them as crude, low fidelity experiments. Test it with one customer on a Tuesday afternoon with some Play-Doh. And if if it's rejected, great, you learn quickly. If it's not, don't go crazy, then double the size of the experiment. And over time, you sort of marshal ideas down a very deliberate process where the experiments become higher fidelity and more intricate and, and more more realistic in terms of you know the, the 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 real state that they will ultimately be on. So by the time you actually go to launching an idea, you've significantly de-risked it through a series of experiments. Yeah, fail fail fast and early, and, and iterate the kind of core to 
lean startup, lean canvas methodology. And, and, and to that point, and it, it seems counterintuitive to some extent, the rise of the venture and startup studios versus accelerators and incubators, where the first step is let's kill as many of the ideas we come up with as we possibly can. And those that survive are the ones that go to the next step and get assigned teams. And they found that it's much more efficient way to do it because you're, you're forced to be a consultant to your own ideas rather than falling in love with it. And uh, it, you know, interesting, interesting paradox. It still goes back to some of the things that we saw when we transitioned from waterfall methodology for software development to what we called spiral in the old days and now agile, the idea of that incremental iterative de-risking, you know, and spiraling through a process. 100%. Yeah. So I, I spent time as a venture capital investor. I, I, I've been involved in the launch of about 100 startups. And so you're, you're exactly right. The venture studio model, for those that don't know, is basically where the fund itself is generating its own ideas, mm -hmm. testing them, prototyping them, getting rid of the ones that they don't like. And then when, when, they, when they hit something that, that, that shows promise, only then do they hire a professional team of, of leaders to, to actually build the company. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that model. We actually did that several times and we enjoyed some, some terrific uh, results. The other thing, too, is you know, back to this agile and, and small step thing. Back to our jazz classical conversation for a second. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, you talked about you know, classical, that age being this incredible, wild, expansive, uh, creative era, which it was for the composers. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to dismiss the, the, the instrumentalists that, that play their, mm -hmm. their music, mm -hmm. but there's less room for interpretation. Like the goal in many cases is to play the notes on the page exactly as they were written. Mm -hmm. So if we're conducting the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, where I have the privilege of, of being a, a board member, you know, they're playing a Beethoven piece. You know, it tells you how loud to play each note and when to attack it and what mm -hmm. the timbre is. And like you, 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 there's room for creativity to be clear, but, but it, it's pretty instructional. Mm -hmm. where, and so, so now you're exhibiting the creativity of Beethoven. I like jazz because jazz is more democratized. Mm. In jazz, it's not just the, the, the composer or perhaps the conductor, it's everybody. Mm. Everybody is part of the creative process. Everyone is, in, is, is involved, and that's kind of how I think the modern workforce needs to work. Small, messy teams that are, that are passing the baton of, of leadership back and forth, that are taking responsible risks, that are making mistakes and course correcting quickly, and everybody gets to contribute to the masterpiece each and every day. And you're making decisions in the face of ambiguity, because let's face it, it would be a luxury that we don't have anymore to be able to just play the notes in front of you. But we're living in a world that's too complex and fast moving. We have to perform in the business world without the notes in front of us. We have to improvise. We have to play jazz. And so I think it's actually really a really a powerful metaphor of what we're facing in today's world, whether it's a startup or, or a later stage business, that we all need to really tap into the creative might of, of every single person on our team. Great perspective and, and great insight there. So tell us about a day in the life of Josh Linkner. How do you spend your time today? Well, um, being a jazz guy, I, I like variety, you know, so no two days are exactly alike. Um, I do a ritual, though. I do a creativity ritual every single day. I'm happy to share it. Uh, I, I literally spend like less than five minutes a day on it, and it sets me up. It's sort of like a B12 shot of creativity that lasts for 16 hours going forward. Uh, so I, I always start my day with that. I do a lot of learning. I, I, I They always say, you know this, in software engineering, you want to change the outputs, you got to change the inputs. Mm -hmm. So I, I do, obviously, we all focus on our outputs, but I also try to focus on the inputs. And I try to read and, and absorb and, you know, take in a bunch of content and I, I to a degree, a professional learner. And so I, I, I spend a lot of time learning. I spend a lot of time teaching and I spend a lot of time creating stuff. Those are my three favorite things to do. But back on the ritual real quick, just to give people a tactical tool. You know, when you, you when you're playing music, Jeff, you, you didn't just show up on stage, you know, grab your instrument out of the case and go. You, you'd practice, you'd warm up, you kind of do some breathing exercises, get ready to perform. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do every day for creativity. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of real quick ones. One thing I do is back to the input concept. I spend one minute, literally one minute, set a timer, guzzling the creative input of others. All I do is bathe in others' creativity. I might watch a YouTube video of a band playing. I might stare at a painting for, for a minute, read a poem out loud. It's just simply absorbing the creative energy of other people to get to kind of prime the pump. The other thing that I always do is I give myself an unrelated challenge. I think of this as like jumping jacks for creativity. So instead of a challenge that matters to me, like how am I going to sell more books or whatever, I look in the news and I might see what's a challenge going on right now. And I like to pick a big one. Like how about racial injustice? That's a big one. But I don't try to solve it with one idea. I say, if I had to chip away at this, if I had to come up with 15 little teeny ideas that won't solve the problem, but might make a dent in the problem, what might those be? And so all I'm doing is, is giving myself 
a creative challenge that has nothing to do with my own personal life. It's not a directive. It doesn't affect my family, but I'm giving myself practice solving problems, little, little creative, little micro innovations at a time. And so just a couple of those rituals like that every morning really do go a long way. Very good. <laughs> what are you, what are you reading? What's on your reading list right now? Um, man, I've been reading a lot of great stuff. Um, I just read Rethink by Adam Grant, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend it. Um, I just finished Soundtracks by John Acuff, which is also terrific. I just finished How uh, How to Change by Katie Milkman, uh, also a Penn professor. It's terrific. And I just uh, started reading this book called, De I think it's called Decoding Greatness. And basically is around reverse engineering um, the creative process. <clears throat> so instead of sort of this ground up, you know, blank page approach, sort of reverse engineering how people achieve masterful things and learning from it. And I'm only halfway through it, but it's a terrific book. Very good. So, so uh, you you shared a, a copy of your book with us a few moments ago. Big little breakthroughs. Why don't you show that to our to our uh, viewers again and tell our viewers and listeners where they can find it and and where they can connect with you. Sure. So it's called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations, there it is, Drive Oversized Results. And the whole principle behind it is I sort of took what we most often think of innovation and flipped it upside down. We most often think of like these giant moonshots that change the world. And this is the opposite. It's a much more deliberate and pragmatic approach to chipping away one little micro innovation at a time. So it's cultivating high velocity of small daily innovations as opposed to waiting around for the the, 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 the one, the silver bullet approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's way less risky, it's more accessible, it, it builds critical skill, and these little ideas really add up. It, furthermore, it really democratizes it. To me, I always get upset when I think of innovation as some you know exclusive members only club where they're no longer accepting applications. Like only people wearing lab coats or hoodies get to be creative. Forget that. This is like innovation for the rest of us. And I wanted to write a book that that, that any one of us, whether you're you know a dental assistant or you're a stay-at-home mom or you're you're running a, a sales organization, whatever your, your your path may be, how can we cultivate and, and build creative skills to drive better outcomes? And that, that's what the book is all about. So you can learn more about it if you're interested at biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Of course, you can buy the book there. On the audiobook, by the way, I read it, but I also played some jazz guitar in between all the chapters, so it's a little fun. But even if you don't buy it, um, there, I would recommend checking it out because there's a whole toolkit. There's downloadable worksheets. There's a creativity assessment. All that's free, by the way. So so if you want, you know, check it out. It, it really can be a nice partner for those looking to take their innovation, their creativity to the next level. And once again, that's just biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Jeff, any Parting questions from you? No, I mean, just, just an observation that in embracing the idea that incrementalism is a pathway to being innovative. Uh, uh, you, you know, Lewis Patler is another guy that we've had on. He's written some books about, uh, you know, breaking the model and whatnot. And, and he kind of makes the point that if you want to have a culture of innovation that sticks, you can't have the innovators off in a skunk work somewhere and hope that somehow is osmotically kind of seeps out. So I, I love that. I mean, that's accessible and approachable. I think that's a fantastic insight that more people ought to take to heart. So we get out of the sort of view of the statistical outliers and innovation theater and into making it everybody's business in an enterprise. I love that. It's great. I totally agree with you. And and if you have 10,000 people or 10 people or 100,000 people, why not have all of them be innovators in their own way? Again, I'm not saying do something inappropriate or take stupid risks. Of course not. But but sure. we can all drive better outcomes when we harness human creativity. And again, that doesn't only apply to the C-suite. That applies to us all. Josh, it's been a pleasure having you with us today. Yeah, thanks very much for coming on. Great insights. Well, Jeff and Jeff, thank you. And I really celebrate the work you're doing. You're making the world a better place. I, I admire your, 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 your program here and grateful to have, have had a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And please check yeah. out uh, Josh's book at biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Did I get that right? Biglittlebreakthroughs.com. You got it. Thanks so much. See you on the next episode. Hey, folks, this is Jeff Amrine. We want to thank you for tuning in. We sincerely appreciate your time. If you're enjoying the Innovation Junkies podcast, please do us a huge favor. Click the subscribe button right now and please leave us a review. It would mean the world to both of us. And don't forget to share us on social media.